Hello everybody, welcome to a Fundamental Games How to Play video. We're going to learn today how to play Castle Scape. This is designed by Josh Horsley of Praetorian Board Games with the art by Tracy Van Wagener. And this game is not actually available to purchase yet, but it is coming to Kickstarter fairly soon. I won't quote a date because that's always subject to change, but uh, suffice it to say it should be in spring 2021. All right, so what is Castlescape? Let's take a look. Uh, if we take a look at the rule book here, we're looking on the tabletop simulator version, by the way. Castlescape is about building uh, a castle for a specific reason. The king has commissioned a magnificent castle that will span the ages. The ones who build it will be blessed with riches, power, and renown for all time. Your guild is ready to answer the call, and you'll claim the rewards by any means necessary. Ah, but there's equally devious guild masters of the kingdom buying for this opportunity, so you must out-recruit, out-build, and out-maneuver each of them if you want to get ahead. And you must be vigilant, for as you construct his castle, the king will make inspections, and if he discovers your underhanded business dealings, he may strip your guild of its influence and resources. So be cautious, clever, and cunning, for only one guild will earn fortune and fame. There you go, that's a quick overview. Uh, as for what is the game itself, it's a deck building area control game set in the Middle Ages, a time of kings and guilds, money, power, deception, and influence, and we're assuming the roles of guild masters. We're gonna be building a castle with physical components, um, basically castle walls. We're gonna be building a deck, each of us has our own deck, and we'll have special contracts and individual goals to achieve. So let's go over the setup here of the board, if I can manipulate this. So it looks a little bit complex at first, but trust me, it all works together quite well. What I'll do is I'll, we'll flip to the rule book, even though the game sets itself up and describe it. So it says here, start by preparing the quarry and the game board. So the game board is right here in the center of the table. And all of these little grid lines are where um, basically pieces of castles will be moving and one castle piece is set in the middle here and everything has to build upon that. Um, and then there is a quarry. So a quarry is basically where all of extra pieces are laid and these are pieces where you can acquire them by playing cards from your hand. So you'll acquire these wall pieces that you will then lay out on to this board. Uh, and the goal of that being to, let's just take out a piece of wall here. Um, we'll just copy some of these pieces to show you how it works but the goal is that you want to build enclosed sections of land to earn points equal to the value of the area inside there are other ways to earn points but this is kind of the, the base way is to um, have foundational areas and that's where the area control piece sits in so if i build enough walls to create this enclosure i'll gain six points on the victory track here so that's what the quarry is for and the game board is for, the first two parts of setup. Um, I'll leave those set up for now, but we'll delete them when we, well, when I get into gameplay, which will be a separate video anyway. All right, so that is the quarry and the game board. Uh, next off, we have to prepare the guilds. Each player will choose a color for their guild, and then they have to take their guild mat and all pieces of their color, which includes 13 recruit crew cubes, some Bailey claim markers, an infamy token, a corruption token, and a player reference card. So let's take a look at that aspect of the game. Uh, we'll rotate over here and we'll say that this here is our player mat. So you can see here we have a back alley that's a, a special area of gameplay for when you do underhanded dealings that the king doesn't like. Uh, this is our infamy token, this is our corruption token, this is our 10 card deck, and here it talks about these are the claim markers and these are the recruits which are basically uh, workers or um, kind of protectors that go onto the board and they help you gain extra points the blue claim marker is actually put inside of what we call a bailey which is an enclosure of walls in a castle and so when you place that you show that you built that section and you gained those points all right let's continue on through the robot you see here that is the recruits, that is the Bailey claim markers, that's the infamy token, corruption token, and then we have a player reference card just to help us guide us through each turn of play. We would place one of our recruits on the zero space of the renowned track, so each player would take one of their recruits, and this would go on 
the Renown track, which is already here. Um, and should there be a second player, which there is if I pass the player two, then um, you would see that. I can't see their board right now for some reason. Okay, let's continue on through the rule book though. So then we take a starter deck of 10 cards. Let's just show you what that consists of. We'll search the deck and show you that these 10 cards, um, we have all, every player starts with the same 10 cards. Cards that allow you to gain walls, cards that allow you to gain gold, cards that allow you to um, gain recruits. And there are cards that are called back alley cards. You can see those through the token on the bottom, or sorry, the image on the bottom of the card. So some of the cards that give you gold, like this one here, you can see on the bottom of it, would give me um, that back alley or, or um, just not good things, kind of like a corruption type of thing, a clumsy thief. So he's stealing the gold, whereas some of your old, other gold is earned through the markets in a legitimate manner manner and you'll be able to acquire more cards in the game just like most deck builders but you start with 10 cards in your main deck all right so let's go to the side of the game board and so now we'll flip to the next page see what else there is for setup reveal goals so depending on the number of players there will be a set number of public goals over here so right now you can see here for two players there are three goals for three players there are four and for four players there are five goals now these goals do not get replaced in the game, so once somebody achieves one of these goals, they claim the card and the points affiliated with that. So for example here, if you play seven walls in a single turn, you will immediately gain the four points shown on the top right of that card, and this would kind of go into your play area or your hidden area. This goal is worth five points if you have seven or more recruits on the board, and this goal is worth five points if you claim a bailey that has six or more squares in it much like the one that I, I built here as an example. If I built that, that would give me this card as well. Now there are quite a few other cards in there as well. Again, you can search through here and see. There is uh, claiming a bailey with seven influence, claiming two baileys in a turn, placing five recruits, etc. So there's various goals and that allows for game variation. So each game you may have different goals, you may have different focuses or strategies to earn some of those bonus points because trust me that Five points is a fair chunk of points in this game. The track goes up to 50. Most players don't score 50 points in a game, uh, which means a, a five point card is worth even 10% of this track, which you don't normally get all the way to the end anyway. All right, let's continue on to the rule book wherever I left that. I think I have it over here. So, so that is the Goals, all right, and then each player also has individual contract cards. We'll get that, oh, so set up marketplace. Shuffles are rotating market cards with the green borders and deal card, five cards face up into the five stalls of the marketplace. So we'll look at that next, we'll rotate this around. Uh, this is a deck building game, and like most deck builders, there are cards that you can purchase. Now, some deck builders like Clank only have a rotating or have a rotating market with standard cards. Some have only a rotating market like Ascension, and some have um, always standard cards like Dominion. So this kind of blends uh, Ascension, Dominion together, much like Clank, where you always have these four cards that you can purchase any turn, and then you have these cards which will rotate and they'll actually disappear in between the King's of Inspection and get reset. So there's always going to be newness throughout the game. And you can see by the borders how to separate them when you're separating your deck after a game and trying to set up for the next game. So the rotating market cards can vary in cost. You can, here I'll zoom in a bit. Um, so the top left is the cost in gold to purchase that. And some cards will also have a cost on the top right, that purple number. And that purple is an amount of corruption, I believe, that you would gain by um, trying to acquire that card. So if I obtain the King's Treasury, it does cost corruption because I'm basically planning to do something unsportsmanlike, un unkingly, and kindly. Um, and if I'm quoting that wrong, it could be, I'd have to double check the rules again, it could be corruption or it could be infamy that you're gaining, but I'm pretty certain you're gaining corruption by purchasing the card. And then other cards like this one will give you infamy on the bottom left of the card, which can lead to corruption um, if you don't manage it very well. 
All right, but anyway, anytime somebody buys something from the rotating market at the end of their turn, it will get replaced. That's how the rotating market works. And anybody can buy cards from these during their turn if they pay gold. We'll continue on. So that is the rotating market cards. Then you separate the standard market cards and they, they go face up. So these will be in every single game. The craftsman shop that lets you get more gold. The higher offense that lets you get gold and destroy a card in your hand or discard pile. So basically making your deck more efficient by getting rid of junk or stuff that's not as powerful as stuff that you purchase. Uh, back alley bribes gives you two recruits, but also gives you infamy. So getting extra recruits can help you earn more points in the game. And Rampart, so this is a, a standardized law gaming card. Laws are really important to the game, hence Castlescape building castle. All right, and then you have contract cards. So it says to shuffle the contract cards, deal four face down to each player. Players choose two to keep and shuffle the others back into the contract deck. And you don't show the other players your contract cards. So we're at the start of a game right now. You'll see in my hand, I have four contract cards. These are very similar to the goal cards with the exception being that they are not public knowledge, pardon, not public knowledge, and um, there's no there's no penalty if you don't accomplish them. There's only a bonus if you do accomplish them. So this contract here at the end of the game, if I have exactly seven recruits on the board, I will get seven extra points. For this card, if I have the Bailey with the most enclosed squares at the end of the game again, then I will gain four points. So large courtyard, claim the bailey with the most enclosed squares. Um, this contract, claim a bailey consisting of at least 16 wall pieces. And this one, end the game with the most back alley cards. So they all have different values and, and abilities. You can see here there's 16 more cards here uh, for these contracts. So what I would do is I would pick two of them. So let's just say I, um, take these two. I'm not going to play with those two, so these two would go back into here and I'd shuffle that deck. And now these ones I can put into my hidden area since I'm playing on Tabletop Simulator. But I can look at them anytime, it's just my opponents can't see them. Um, so there you go. Uh, that is the goal cards and then my opponent would have the same thing. Alright, now you're ready to begin the game. May the best guild win. So if I were to pass this over to the, no, they're not. Pastor, no. If you pass to this player's turn, this player does not have a board, but obviously both players would have a board. We're going to play through an example turn here and show you how it works now that we have done a complete setup. Um, maybe we'll start with the anatomy of a card since the the whole game revolves around this deck building mechanic that you have. So it says here we have on the top of the card the card title, to the left of the card the cost to acquire that card from the market. So it cost me three gold to permanently acquire this card. Uh, the image in the center, the ability in the uh, bottom return a card, and then on the bottom bottom it's the lowest part of the card whether I gain infamy and or corruption for playing this card. That's the anatomy of the card shown here. All right. There's different colored cards. There's green, there's gray, and there's blue. So blue are the rot or the standard market. Green are the rotating market. And gray are your base deck cards. So we'll just slide this card back here. We should probably position back into play. That is the anatomy of a card. Continue on. We'll progress through the rulebook. Player turns. So I'm going to go through some examples of how to play a turn. So at the beginning of a turn, or at the end of a turn I should say, I would draw five cards. Um, I would start the game by having five cards in my hand. So one, two, three, four, five. Um, you know, we've got to end your turn, I think. Pass turn. Okay, back to this player. Now I should be able to draw cards. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, so I start with these five cards in my hand. And the way it directs in the rule book is you, any cards that you choose to play, which is usually going to be all of them, it's very rare you wouldn't play all of them, but any cards you're going to play, you set out in your play area. So I might just take all of my cards and put them into my play area. 
I can then progress by playing or activating each card uh, in any order I choose, but there is one exception. And so that exception will say that, here we'll, we'll check the player aid cards actually, since we're on the player turns now. As you can see here, um, so draw extra cards first, play any cards and resolve actions in any order with the exception that all recruits must be placed after walls and recruits cannot be placed on top of a wall. So it's that simple, if I have recruits, I have to play them after walls, so I'd want to play my wall cards first. Let's say I'm going to play this card and this card. We'll activate those first. I would gain four walls, two for this card and two for this card. I would double check on the bottom of my card, make sure they neither of them give me infamy, which they don't, and I will take these four walls and I have to decide when to place. I can. I don't have to place them yet. I can gain the walls now, and then I can place them after. Um, I can gain a recruit. So let's do that. I gain a recruit, and I gain two gold. Now the gold is kind of illusionary. You can't save it over from turn to turn. So gold. Usually I do that as the last part of my turn, even though you could do it beforehand. It usually doesn't have an impact on the game whether you do it before or after. Uh, so let's start with the walls. We're going to delete all of these. We've got the main wall there. So for each card, I have to play the walls in a contigu contiguous or connected manner. So the, the walls must, it's like I'm building a two-part wall. If I had three walls, I'd have to have all three walls connected. Um, it could, you know, I could have um, the third one go kind of like this shape here. It could go in a corner, but they all have to connect. So for my first two wall card, I'm going to place those there. And for my second two wall card, um, let's bring these over here. Uh, I have to decide where do I want to put these other two walls. I could make the wall bigger. I'm not going to get any points for building the wall out this way, but I have created a large area. I really had no way to do an enclosure if I placed the walls like this. Um, I actually set it up for my opponent to maybe gain that daily. So we're going to play it like that. And so now my walls are played. Then I can play a recruit. Now it does specifically state on the card that recruits may not be placed on top of a wall. Now that does matter um, later on in the game for scoring purposes. So I can only place my recruit adjacent to a wall. So I'm going to place my recruit there. It's adjacent to a wall that I've just built. It's not on top of a wall. So it's all good. So now we have done that, and now I have one, two gold, and neither of those gold are the Clumsy Thief, so it's just two gold I get. And I can purchase any card in the rotating or standard card market that costs two or less. Um, so that costs seven, that costs three, that costs four, six, four. Many of these cards do cost two or three, but I don't, not at this time. So right now I can either buy higher offense or I could buy Craftsman Shop. So I can gain more gold or gain um, a fence. So we are going to gain this card here. When you gain a card, it goes to your discard pile. And now I've spent my two gold. Any cards here would um, end up going into the discard pile. Now let me, let's see. Here, we're just going to Configure my interface. Um, for some reason, mod caching. No mod caching off. Normally in this game, there are little things here that help you pass the turn. Now, I don't know how it works for hot seat, so I may have to just make do as best I can. All right, so now I would take all of these and they would go to my discard pile. If I did have any cards with infamy, it would actually go into my back alley, but I didn't have any cards with infamy this turn. And then I would draw back up to five cards, which should be my whole deck because I only had 10 cards to start with. And then it would be the next player's turn. Now I don't have another deck to play with here, so let's Take these and copy them. We're gonna, we're just gonna rebuild the deck over here, and we'll take. 
a lot of curves here for some reason. Not sure what I've done. Oh, I might have taken all of the curves. These should be the ones that we just took. Those are the five we just took. And then, oh, we accidentally took a whole bunch of cards somehow. Uh, we took the whole stack of cards, that's why. We only wanted one of those cards. Now what I'm going to do is copy these, and then we'll paste them over here and pretend to take the other cards too. There we go. Group all these. Put these here, that's their deck. All right. And then we're going to copy this and build one of these over here. So we now have built another player. Unlock that. Put that there. Unlock that. So you get to see some tabletop simulator tricks here. All right. So this player's turn is done. So that would be on to the next player. So the next player would uh, draw their five cards. I'm just going to put them right into the play area. Just because I, I probably would do that anyway. And then this player gets to go. So this player has four walls and three gold. So they would take four walls from here. It might seem like I'm grabbing walls fast, but um, when we look at the quarry board for a two-player game, we're going to be playing through one, two, three inspections. So this quarry will fill up two more times and plenty of walls to be gained. So I've got four walls that I can position. Now I may want to, if I were to enclose this guy here, uh, I would still get the points for it, but um, he may get points for it later on. Well, look, sorry, let's show you what the word book says so I don't misquote it. Um, back alley of new corruption. Clean up player turns. Purchase cards, here we go. What we want to read about is taking walls from the quarry, building walls, completing a bailey. So completing a bailey, a group of squares completely enclosed by walls. You may not build a two by two block of walls, so you always have to have an open space in between, so there is a bailey. And when a bailey is completed, renewing points are immediately awarded to the player with the most influence in the bailey. So that is why you don't want to build a wall around somebody else's cube, um, or somebody else's recruit, I should say. So if I were to build these around this blue recruit, the blue player would actually gain the points for me doing that. So I really don't want to do that right now. So I might do something like this and just start building away so that once I have recruits on the board, I can build baileys around it. So we're going to do it that way. We've done the two walls. Now we don't have any recruits, so we really didn't want to enclose anything. But we do have one, two, three gold. And note on the bottom of this one that that shows a wanted infamy. So this card, instead of going to the discard pile, is going to be going down into the back alley for future reference. Then we have three money. So we can buy anything that costs three money. So we could buy the dumpster dive, or we could spend three money up here to buy back alley bribes. Um, return a card from your discard pile or back alley to your hand. This player is, you don't have to spend all three gold. So this player will take some extra recruits. They're gonna buy this card here. Uh, so that will go to their discard pile. And then they would draw five cards, but we'll just leave their deck like that. We're back to player one, uh, so they would get to play their hand again. Uh, let's group these, put those in the discard pot where they're supposed to be. So they play their hand, and now we have one, two, three, four gold, and one recruit. So might as well do our recruit first. We play our recruit card, we get a blue recruit. We can put it anywhere on the board adjacent to a wall, uh, but not on a wall. Let's go over here, and then we have four gold, and but both of these are going to go into the back alley. All right, we don't get to build any walls this turn. So for four, four gold, we could purchase the king's treasury card, or we could go over here and purchase some ramparts. Let's let's purchase some ramparts. We like walls, 
that would go into the discard pile. Um, these ones will go into the discard pile. And this player's turn would be done. And what happens is if at the end of your turn you do not have enough cards to draw from your deck, what you have to do is take any cards that are in your dis or your back alley and so you can see I have two infamy so I would gain two infamy and then put these into my discard pile uh, flip it over shuffle it and that would become this player's deck and then they'll draw their five cards which these will be in their hand but we're just gonna put them up here and we'll go back to this player's turn this player would draw their five cards so we'll just put them up here now again the first two turns of any deck builder are pretty basic you're playing with all the same cards just might get them in a different arrangement so in this case this player is getting two recruits we've got to formulate a bag of different colored recruits here so let's copy this and give this player some recruits but we are going to change these recruits to a different color since I don't have another bag here. Take all that, change the color, we're going to make them red. All right. This player can play two recruits. We've got one recruit card there, one recruit card there, and again they can place them anywhere adjacent to a wall and not on top of a wall. Well, we could go beside this other player or we could plan that we're going to try to build a castle wall up here and we may want to gain some influence over there and look at this one here so we're kind of competing for this area and have our own area here and then they have three gold one of which has to go into the back alley so three gold group those together put them in the discard pile that, that would normally happen at the cleanup phase but i'm just kind of getting ahead of myself here and this player is going to do the dumpster dive card. Why? Because they can. All right. So this player is out of cards. They will gain their two infamy. Don't have an infamy token, so we will copy that. All right. And then they would group those together, flip them over, shuffle them off, put them in their draw pile. And then they would gain their five cards to their hand, which I'm putting on top of the table. We go back to this player. We'll flip these over. And so now we built up our deck. We got one of the deck, one of the cards that we had purchased. And that's the great thing about deck builders is over time you get to benefit from the cards that you chose to invest in. So this turn we get two walls plus three walls, which means we get five walls, a recruit, and two gold. Over here, we're going to take five walls. We'll put one of them back. We'll just slide these over here for now. Oops. Put that back in the quarry. So we've got five walls. And have to decide where to position them. Now, one of them is a three block, so these three have to stay connected. And one of them is a two block. So, what we could do is we could do the two block there, and then we could do the one, two, three block here. So what happens when you do that is now this player has enclosed what we call a bailey. When they enclose a bailey they immediately have to assess who has the most influence there. Influence is determined by the number of recruits, a recruit on the ground being worth one influence, and if there were a recruit on top of a wall that'd be worth two influence um, as long as it can oversee that bailey. So in this case only blue has influence in here because there's nothing on the walls and only blue has a recruit inside the bailey. So we gain that, which gives us an immediate two points, one, two. All right, nothing else changes in here. Um, and we will continue to play. There's um, so one rule I'm gonna actually double check on and that's how do you get a recruit onto a wall. So let's double check that ruling. Um, recruits. Okay. Hiring recruits, positioning recruits before you position your recruits. You must finish building any walls. Place it on unoccupied square of the build site. 
you may not position a recruit on top of a wall unless using a card that allows you to do so. If you build a wall on a square containing a recruit, it goes onto the wall. So that's one thing I haven't explained to anybody yet. But if at any time we were to build a wall on top of a recruit, so if this wall for some reason went here instead, then this recruit would go on top of the wall. It doesn't matter whether you place the wall or somebody else did. Basically, you're promoting that recruit, and that recruit has more influence now. So that's something to keep in mind when you are planning out where to put your recruits and what you're doing with your opponent's recruits. So, um, having influence on top of the wall is much more powerful than on the ground because you can oversee multiple baileys, and they're worth twice as much influence. Okay, so we've built the five walls, we've gained our bailey, we've placed our token, um, and then we have uh, one more recruit. So we can take a recruit from the recruit bag and choose where to place it. You cannot place it on top of a clay marker, as far as I know. Um, so we'll place that here so that we have a chance to mess around with that player. Then we have two gold, and neither of which is um, causing any infamy. So for two gold, now this card should have been replaced. Now this player is going to buy two gold. All right, so all these go back into their discard pile, and then they would draw five cards. You go through your deck fairly quickly, especially since you only start with 10 and generally you're only buying one card a turn. You can purchase more than one card if you have enough gold, um, but probably doesn't happen too, too often. All right, and we go back to this player here. We're still learning how to play. Now, one of the things that we have not done, actually we're going to give this player two random contract cards since I didn't have those for this player. So this player might want to have more recruits than, than not at the end of the game. That would earn them five extra points. And they might want to have the most walls in their deck. So cards that build walls. If they have more cards that build walls than cards that do anything else in their deck at the end of the game, they would gain an extra four points. Um, whereas this player, again, we don't have to hide it because we're playing against ourselves. Um, this one wants seven recruits exactly on the board at the end of the game, and they want to claim the Bailey with the most enclosed squares. So they want to make a really big Bailey. Okay. So we were going back to this player's turn. Blue, blue just had a good turn. We're on to red, so red flips over. And red has two walls and lots of gold. So we'll deal with the walls first. And then you're going to get to see what happens with an inspection. That's kind of going to wrap up our how to play video. And then I might go into an actual pull player versus player scenario for a future video. So this player could play two walls anywhere. If they chose to, they could place a wall here and here. So they put a wall here and here, and then their red recruit gets promoted. So now they have more influence um, than this cube right now which is kind of their goal there. Then they have one, two, three, four gold, one of which is going in the back alley. So for four gold, they can purchase a card. And they might want to buy a pact. Gives them minus one infamy plus two gold. So let's say they buy that card. It goes into their discard pile. All of these go into their discard pile. and then they would draw their cards. But now we want to learn what happens when the king's inspection takes place. And if you're playing with TTS mod against another player, this would be automated, but obviously in a physical game, you have to do it manually. So let's do it manually. The inspections. So in, if the quarry runs out of walls, you trigger an inspection at the end of the turn. To conduct it, you must clear the rotating market discarding all cards. So what happens is any cards that were in here get shifted into a discard pile, so those will never be used again. And this row would get replenished. So that forces 
uh, a change in the game because maybe people didn't want the cards that were in there, they were getting stale and they're too expensive, or you just kind of mess with people's plans that wanted the cards in there because some of the cards work really, really well together. So now we've got a whole new row of cards. You can see some are as cheap as one, some are as expensive as seven, which were in the discard pile. But... All right, so that's phase one of the inspection. Next, we remove influence. So the player whose turn is next must check their infamy level. If it's more than zero, they must remove recruits from the board until they have removed an amount of influence equal to their level of infamy. So it says influence, it doesn't say recruits. And the reason for that is recruits that are on walls are worth more um, influence than recruits on the ground. So if we were looking at this player, they have two infamy, so they must remove two influence off the board. This is the red player, so they could simply remove this one red one instead of removing this one which is worth one and this one is worth two. They have to remove a minimum of two anyway, so they remove this guy for two influence. And that brings their infamy back down to zero. And this player must do the same thing to get their infamy back down to zero. They must remove two points. So they could remove um, this guy and this guy, for example. So those are back. So some of the, their best laid plans, uh, because of the King's Inspection, they need to remove those recruits. Next, on the Inspection, uh, once that player has removed influence equal to their infamy, the next player does the same. All players must do this. If you had any infamy remaining after removing your recruits, you must then discard cards from your, uh, what does it say? Discard a card of your choice per remaining infamy. So if I had uh, two more infamy and I didn't have any recruits on the board, I'd have to discard two cards from my hand, thereby making my next turn a little bit less effective. And if I still didn't have enough, if I had you know 12 infamy and removed five from the board influence, and still had to remove seven, I'd have to start losing, um, uh, whatchamacallit, Renown. So if you have, uh, if I had two Renown and I didn't have enough cards to make up for the infamy, I'd actually start losing points. And then it is possible to have less than zero Renown, so you could have negative Renown because you're so poorly managing or such a reckless builder. Anyway, we then reset each player's infamy to match their corruption level. Now, so if we did have corruption, when the King's Inspection takes place, we reset our infamy to our corruption level. There are cards in the game that give you corruption, as we saw. Um, so they're on the bottom of the card, I believe. So if a card were to give you corruption, we'll just try to find you an example here. This card here. So if I played that card, I would immediately gain one corruption. And that would go there, which means on any turn where the King's Inspection happens, once my Infamy runs down, I have to put this at the same level as corruption, which means you have permanently more Infamy. Um, so that rule is a little bit complex at first, but it makes sense once you get used to it. You then award an occupation bonus. So for every completed Bailey, award one Renown to the player who has the most influence. Right now there's only one completed Bailey on this map and the player who has the most influence is blue. So they would gain one more Renown. So it's like a bonus point. Now if for some reason red was up here, they would have two versus blue's one influence. So red would actually gain a point for having more influence over that Bailey. So that happens in between, or happens during each inspection. So three times in a two-player game, players could earn bonus points for the um, occupation bonuses. And then what would happen is you'd reset the quarry. It tells you on here that for two players, 15 walls happen over the course of four inspections. Uh, for three players, 23 walls over the course of three inspections, etc. So then we would take. Um, our 15 walls and replace them into the quarry here. So I won't bring them all over, but you kind of get what I mean there. Uh, actually, we could just do there. We've got 15 walls in the quarry. If I were playing with uh, four players, I'd have to put 30 walls in the quarry because each player is going to be playing walls and, and building up the board even more. So you need more in your resource pool. 
So I like how the game scales out like that. That's well done. And that is the king's inspection. Is there anything else in there? If it were the final inspection, then um, it says here in the final round, all players get one final turn after the inspection. And if they play cards that give them walls, they can pull them from the supply. A neat little thing. We still get one last turn, one last kick of the cat to earn some points at the end of the game. Okay, that is how to play. How do you win? Well, you win by having the most renown at the end of the game. How do you earn renown? Well, we talked about it before, but you gain renown by building baileys. You get immediate points equal to the area of the bailey that you built. You get points for um, having the most influence during the king's inspection over baileys that are already built, like we showed you there. You gain points for completing objective cards, so these here, the, the kind of public goals. You gain points through your personal objective cards, your contracts, and you also gain points for the cards in your deck. So I didn't really review that, but on the top right, uh, those are worth points at the end of the game. So if I buy this card for five, it's also worth five points at the end of the game. Um, so I might have misread that earlier, thinking that was corruption, but no, that is points at the end of the game. So this card cost me one gold, it's not worth any points at the end of the game, but it is a good gold builder. This card here costs six money, gives me plenty of walls, but doesn't give me any points at the end of the game. So this card is really worthwhile for points at the end of the game. But when you buy it, you get two infamy, so it's, it's not the greatest there. And all it does in the game is replaces itself as a card. Uh, so there are cards that might be worth one point. So you get cards that are worth points. I don't th believe there are cards worth negative points. Um, let's see what else we're missing for scoring. I'm sure, I can't remember if infamy has any impact on end of game scoring. So final inspection, final scoring. So add up all renown for your fulfilled contracts, any cards in your deck that have purple renown that will increase your renown score. Then you subtract one renown for each corruption you have, so that's important to know. So for each corruption you have, which is this uh, broken hammer, you actually lose that many points at the end of the game as well. So those cards are powerful, but they have a negative impact on your end of game scoring. After all players tally their score, whoever the most renown renown wins, and then there's a couple of rules for tiebreakers. So there you have it, Castlescape. Um, that was just a brief overview of how to play. I do plan on doing a full player versus player playthrough from start to finish. I won't go to the in-depth explanation that I just went to to explain how to play the game, but I will. You'll see more dailies getting built, more scoring taking place, more king's inspections, um, and then the final tally, and see how that all adds up. If you choose to watch that video, I'll try to have that available also before the Kickstarter goes live. I think this is a very intriguing game, strategy laden in that you have to watch what's going on on the board, you have to watch how you're building your deck, you have to understand the balance between your recruits versus your gold, you have to know how infamy and corruption can make or break your game, you have to you know, really decide when is the right time to get more contracts. I didn't even talk about that, but in the game you do have an option to pay five gold to per basically you draw two new contracts, pick one of them, and return the other one back into the contract deck. So you can actually earn more and more ways to get points throughout the game um, if you're doing well or you think you have the means to do so. So again, I like many, many different aspects of this game. I love deck builders. Um, I like the strategy with the walls and trying to balance your recruits. I like the public versus private goals or goals and contracts. Uh, all of those are really neat. And uh, King's Inspection, kind of a, a tertiary way to gain points. I like that as well. Having to, not only is it important to build your Bailey, but maintain influence over the Bailey you built so your opponents don't take advantage and gain points from areas that you built. A lot of talking on my part, but uh, I wouldn't talk that much if I didn't enjoy the game. And I'm really looking forward to seeing Josh Hurley's uh, launch on Kickstarter and see how this game performs and, and probably in game stores next year, I would imagine, based on um, how accessible I think the game is. Deck building is a popular genre. The um, 
the visuals of the game uh, when you can put plastic pieces on a board always fun and when you can do player versus player and watch the area control build even more fun thanks everybody for watching and talk to you next time